So last week we got into this conversation about the Garden of Gethsemane. We we're talking about in these last few weeks, the last few days of Jesus' life. And, um, you know, the, the scene that really, really got to me last week, the part of the story that get, is getting to me now, you know, is that one place in the garden where Jesus is going to make this decision about drinking the cup of suffering, you know, the, the cup of all the brokenness of the past of the world, all the brokenness of the present of his world and all the future brokenness that is going to be in our world from now on and how he took that all on himself. And tonight we're going to talk about, as the story continues, the inevitable outcome to taking on that cup of suffering begins only hours after Jesus is sitting there in that garden by himself with his dad. And the cost and the expense of taking on the brokenness of the world is unimaginable suffering that occurs even before he gets put up on a cross. Unimaginable suffering. And see, if you think about it, that's what the brokenness of the world looks like, amen? If you can think about it in your own life, I think about my own life, the stuff that I'm fully responsible for and the stuff that has happened to me, and I try to bundle that up and put it together, and I look at what that looks like, and I think about what that feels like, and I think about the despair that that would bring into me, and I know that can't be that different for any of us, and I think about collecting all that up, just that much stuff in this room tonight, right? What that suffering would be if it was put into one body, in one life, in one set of thoughts, in one set of emotions, into one man. The crucifixion of Jesus really began that night in that garden, amen, didn't it? It really began that night in that garden. It really wasn't, it really wasn't starting at the event of the cross. It really didn't start when he started, started to get beaten. It really, and humiliated and mocked and, and all of that that happened to him, it really started in that garden when he said, yes, you know what, I'll take that. I'll take that for the love of the world. I mean, that song that Dina just sang, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Look at if there's ever going to be a time in your life where you reckon with the love of your Father God, it's just got to be in these next couple of days. I mean, if you need proof of how far God will go to love you, you just look at this cross. Come tomorrow night and hang out for a while at this cross. Get it? Just get it clear, get a clear view of that. Because see, like most people, most people that have had some kind of interaction with this whole understanding of the crucifixion of Jesus, the way it's told to most people is, see, is you are such a bad, awful, horrible, rotten, messed up person that uh, Jesus had to die for your messed upness on that cross. I mean, the part about us being broken people is true. The part about us qualifying our brokenness is not true. You know, it's not, we're very fond in the church of talking about, you know, a ranking of sins, aren't we? And we're going to be like, there's better sins and there's worse sins, you know? And there's, and you just kind of believe that she thinks that I can't believe he would do that. I can't believe that you would think that. I can't believe you would say that. <laughs> And Jesus is like, I believe all of it because it's all on me. I put it all on me. I put it all on me. The story of the crucifixion of Jesus is a love story. It's not about your badness, which necessitates Jesus getting up on a cross to get you out of your badness. It's a love story where, where you see that God is just desperately in love with you. That cross is the ultimate love story. You, you got to understand that Jesus died for you because you're worth it. Not because you're worth less, but because you're worth it. You're worth his very best. You're worth himself. You know, I'm worth his very best. That's hard for me to accept some days when I don't feel very good, very good about myself. That's hard for me, but it's no less true. And on those days, when I struggle with that, I've got to allow the truth of this love story, the truth of this cross to override the immediacy of my emotions that I'm experiencing about myself, amen? The fact that I'm feeling something, the fact that you're feeling something about yourself doesn't make it true. It just makes it a feeling. This cross 
is the truth. It's the truth about us, yes. About Jesus, yes. About God, yes. And about the Father's love for us and how deep it is, yes. In the story of the crucifixion, we, we're gonna get involved. You know, we might, wanna, we might wanna stand back from that. We might wanna be observers. You know, like a lot of people uh, would avoid church on Good Friday because they just are gonna believe that if, well, if I go to church, I'm gonna get consumed with how bad I feel about what I did to cause this to happen because they don't see it like a love story. Man, if I, if I had my way, if I had my way, we would reverse the way it is in, church, in most churches. And we'd be saying, there were 6,000 people that came to, came to Good Friday worship at Cokesbury Church uh, tomorrow night. We had so many people at, recover, at, at Cokesbury Church for Good Friday, we had to open another campus at a mall someplace when they shut it down, and we had church at six o'clock there because we had to have more room because we finally got the love of the story. I mean, it's, it's, it's something altogether different to go, well, I think I'll come Sunday, because you know I mean? Everybody's gonna be there and we're gonna have a big time and people wear their Easter hat. If you got an Easter hat, I don't know if you wear one or whatever you're gonna wear, but we will get dressed up because man, that's a way of covering ourselves. It's really a way of covering ourselves, trying to feel okay about all of this, amen? And a part of us getting involved in this story is that you gotta get into this deal about, well, what about the stuff that Jesus says about us and our cross? You know, Jesus says, if you love me, um, you will pick up your cross and follow me. He says stuff to the people that follow him. Man, if you wanna hang out with me, you gotta give up your life. You gotta lose your life. What's the deal about that picking up your cross? Well, you know, one of the realities is, is this cross of Jesus, it was the complete deal, amen? There's no other, there is no other time and no other place where your brokenness, my brokenness, your past, my past, your present, mine, your future, mine, just like the cup of suffering, this cross was the coup de grace of God taking it all and releasing us from it all. All of it. See, we're so, the thing of taking up our cross, you know, it's not about us having, to, us having to go through our own crucifixion because Jesus didn't get it done on this one. It's, it's, what he's talking about is, is our cross is actually learning how to do the unspeakable for most of us in this place, or at least it was at one point in time. Taking up our cross is learning how to let go, amen? Learning about step one, I am powerless over the way I'm currently feeling. I am powerless over the fact that when I was seven years old, nine years old, this man pushed me into a, into a room and raped me. I keep trying to find this way to make myself responsible for that. You know, if I was, if I was, maybe I was 11 and I was a guy and maybe my uncle or my brother or whoever, maybe he pushed me somewhere and maybe he raped me. And I didn't say anything. I didn't tell my mom or I didn't tell my dad or I didn't tell anybody because I've never told anybody because I'm trying to figure out what I did to my uncle or my cousin or whoever to make him do that. If I'm a woman and I was raped or molested, I'm trying to figure out what I said, what I did, how I looked, what I wore, what about it was my fault. Because I wanna bear my own crucifixion. But see, Jesus already took it. And when he's talking to us about taking our own cross, taking up our own cross, the, what we gotta bear out is we gotta learn to let go. We gotta learn to understand that that's already up there. He's already accomplished that work of freeing me from that. And tonight, I'm just, what I'm doing is if I'm still holding that, still feeling responsible, still trying to figure out some way to fix it, what's going on, see, is I'm outright rejecting the glory and the victory and the authority of this cross, amen? I'm saying I, don't, I, won't, I will not accept that gift. I'm gonna let it sit on the steps and I'm not gonna unwrap it and I'm not gonna take it and I'm not gonna use it. I wanna walk you through some of the stuff that Jesus experienced on this cross of his. One of the things he said, 
that was written down, there were seven of them. I'm not going to do them all. One of the things he said that always gets to me is he, 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 looked at, he looked at the few people that were watching him suffer and die, and he said, I thirst. I thirst. See, sometimes we get so caught up in the, in the whole spirituality of being a Christian or the spirituality of Jesus that we don't ever think, we're, we're still confused about whether he was really a man. There's sometimes we would rather that he wasn't a full man because it's easier to deal with. But he was. And on his death, at his death place, he was thirsty. He was thirsty. He was thirsty for more than just water. He was thirsty for the love of of his father who, one of the next things he was gonna say is gonna show you what was happening to him. He was thirsty for the love of his father. He was thirsty for the people that were in front of him to understand him. He was thirsty for them to understand what was going on over here. He was thirsty to be able to love them. He's thirsty tonight to be able to love us. You know, a lot of us in this room, we've tried to take our thirst for love and acceptance and approval and security and peace, and we've tried to drink anything else other than the serenity and peace that Jesus brings, amen? Our compulsion, it might not be alcohol, you know, but it's what do we put in our mouth, it's what we watch, it's what we do, what we think, how we function, how we relate to other people. We'll, we'll, we're so thirsty for acceptance, we'll go about it in all kinds of ways that really suck life out of us. I thirst. Jesus actually does know my life. He actually does know absence. He actually does know hunger. He actually does know thirst. He actually does know emptiness. He says, he says to his dad, you know, in the Bible it goes, why have you forsaken me? Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? If he were to come here today, he would say, Dad, why have you left me? Have you, ever, have you ever felt in your life? I mean, most people would have it going on with God in a way where they don't feel close to God at all. Isn't this right? I mean, don't you eventually get to a place where you outright believe, despite this cross, you outright believe that God has just left you? Based on the circumstances in your life, what's happened, what's messed up, what, what you're going through, the hell that you're in, that God has just left you. This is Jesus we're talking about on the cross. Dad, why have you left me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me here to die? And what's it like? I mean, have you ever thought about that? What he's saying there? Have you ever thought about the fact that this Jesus, who the Bible says, Jesus is simultaneously, it's hard to understand, but he's all at once God the creator, he's all at once Jesus the redeemer, and he's all at once the spirit, the mover on lives to really create completely new life in people, the connector. So he has fellowship with himself as father, son, and spirit, right? What was it like on that cross when he was experiencing abandonment from even himself? How can we possibly say that this God who loves us doesn't know those feelings that we have that he just doesn't want us, that we're just not wanted? Why would we go to anybody else other than a God who allowed his own son to have those exact feelings and not get in the way of them? God could have stepped in right there. He didn't. You know why? Because of us. Because of people like Mark Beebe who got to hear that this Jesus who says he loves me knows exactly what it feels like for me when on any given day I feel like God is a billion miles away. And his dad let that happen for the love of you and for the love of me to connect us to himself. He allowed his son to go through that. It just blows me away. Jesus gets to the place of knowing that he's down to the last few minutes of his life. 
And he, he just, he says what, what we'd say, you know? He's got his last sort of will and testament in front of us. And he tells the world, probably in a very quiet voice, it's finished. <clears throat> Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, I quit. He doesn't say, I'm done. He doesn't say, it's over. He says, it's finished. What was it on the cross that Jesus finished? Well, one of the things that I know that he finished, you know, goes farther than the cross. Like he's speaking ahead of himself. And if you read, you know, if you read the Apostles' Creed and you read a certain, you know, you read a version of it, you're gonna see this phrase that maybe you haven't seen before. And what it's gonna say is that, you know, Jesus descended into hell. Like, what is that? It says Jesus descended into hell. Why would Jesus be in hell? Jesus, when he says on this cross, it is finished, he's taken it all the way out to the end of your life and all the way out to mine and all the way to the pits of hell. I don't know if you've ever felt like you were in hell, but if you've ever felt like you were in hell, you never felt more alone than when you felt like you were in hell, amen? And if you know that chilling feeling and you've ever been there and you're like, I'm not gonna get out of this, I'm not gonna make it through this, nobody is here for me, I'm in this by myself and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get beat. And you feel that crushing weight on your head, on your thoughts, on your shoulders, on everything about you and you can't breathe and that's what hell is like, amen? Hell is a look at yourself where you can't look, you just can't look. Hell is a look at the world where it's too dark to be there. And hell is the absolute fear of the fact that you are in the middle of being overpowered. Amen? I don't know of a compulsion that somebody has long enough that they won't eventually describe it as hell. Bill W., if you begin to read how AA got started, you're gonna see that one of the things they talk about is we saw people that were in hell. And we knew that this was, since we saw that, we knew that this disease of ours, this compulsion that any of us has, whatever it is, this is a, we're here tonight because we, someone told us, or maybe you just are here by default, but you're gonna find out sooner or later if you keep coming back, this deal of ours, these compulsions that we have, the way we live, the way we behave, the way we're with other people, this brokenness is us, is a spiritual brokenness. This is a spiritual disease. I can figure out some way to convince you to go to your happy place, like the boy in California that says, go there for six stupid days and you'll get sober. Without the steps, I mean, that guy's, he's on crack probably right now. <laughs> I can figure out some way for you to stop doing what it is you're doing, but you won't be free and you won't be sober and you won't have peace and you won't have life. You'll just be a miserable person that stopped doing what they were doing, that they were coping with. And since you have no new way to cope, you'll just get sicker. You might not get sicker with whatever it is that is, but you will get sicker in your heart. And you will get sicker in your head. And you will get sicker in your life. And because Jesus loves you so much, he after he died on the cross, immediately goes down to fight it out with the devil for you, your corner of hell, your name on it, he went there to battle it out with the devil. 
And you have this corner in hell, just like I do, right? And we all know our spot and there's my stuff and there's the stuff I won't talk about and there's the stuff I won't deal with and there's the stuff that's killing me and there's the stuff that makes me feel inadequate as a dad or a husband or a worker or whatever it is or a man or a woman and there's the stuff, there's all the guilt, there's all the shame, there's all the stuff that keeps me up at night, there's all the stuff that makes me try to find some way to make that go away the roaring fierce lion of hell in my life. And Jesus goes there right to my corner and starts fighting it out with the devil and eliminates my corner and looks the devil right in the eye and says, okay, we're done now. We're done. And what it means for us is is that in hell, that corner that had Mark Beebe's name on it, no longer has any authority over me unless I give it up to it. Because the, the Jesus has defeated that corner and that corner and that corner and that corner And the authority of the cross doesn't stop when his body comes down off of there. The authority of the cross continues right on into hell and right on into Easter and right on into tonight. And if you're in hell tonight, you already have a savior who has fought for you to defeat your corner, to set you free. Whatever it is that you think is there, that is what it is finished. That's what it is finished means. Scripture says this. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And we could go on in history and guilt and shame and inadequacy and all of that. For whatever the, whatever the, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. See, when we sit there and someone tells us, man, you say, what do I gotta do to get free from what's going on in my life? And someone goes, well, what you gotta do is you gotta look at this step one thing. What does step one say? Well, step one says you're powerless over this thing you're talking about. And what we keep trying to do, see, is we keep trying to win it with the law. We keep trying to get the law straight. We keep trying to figure out how to get our own act together. We keep trying to figure out how to settle the score with God. We keep trying to figure out how to get God to love us, get this, when he already does. God sent Jesus' own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, looking like us to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh, all my stuff, all your stuff, your corner of hell and my corner of hell, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Thanks be to Jesus for that. Who do not live in according to the flesh, but now we live, all of us live according to the spirit. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone doesn't have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Jesus. But if Christ is in us, then even though our body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives us life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in us tonight, is in this room tonight. He who raised Jesus from the dead will also, get this, give life to our mortal, broken, addicted, compulsive bodies and lives because of this spirit who lives in us and his name is Jesus. We don't have to worry about overcoming this stuff on our own. We're not our own show. This is not about coming to a place where we tell you to get your act together. This is where we tell you, Jesus is here. 
and has already gotten his act together and is loving you tonight to set you free from yourself. That you can have the life in the Holy Spirit that he is promising you. That's all in Romans 8. And the question I have tonight, the question we'll have tomorrow night is do you think you might be willing, could you be willing to let Jesus finish his good work in you? You know, if you keep wondering, why is it, man, that I keep relapsing? How come I, you know, why do I keep going back out there? Why do I keep getting high? Why do I keep just being sick? Why does this keep going? I don't get it. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to live like this. Why does this happen? I can tell you why it's happening. Because you don't believe that your stuff is up there. You still are trying to, trying to crucify yourself. You're still trying to make yourself pay. And you can do it. You can do it, but it'll kill you. And the question tonight is, will you let Jesus finish it? Will you let him finish the stuff in your life that's holding you from being free? Will you let him tonight finish the stuff in your life that you're carrying around that you can't figure out, that you can't get loose from? Will you let him finish it? Will you let him have it? Will you let him do it? Will you let him show you what this new life is all about? Will you do it? Will you do it? Will you do it? Will you let him finish it? This altar is going to be open. If you're willing to let him finish it, step on up and spend some time with the Victory King in his sweet name. Amen.